Hey everyone, it's Shaban, and today we're going to be talking about ray casting and the many ways that it's super useful in game development. Are you excited to go from someone who doesn't know what ray casting is to someone who does know what ray casting is? I'm super excited. Let's get started. Uh, first, I'm going to write down ray cast. So ray cast is the word, but I want to just kind of go over some other terms that you may have heard around it, which just create confusion, right? So there's ray trace, uh, ray trace, line trace. You may have even heard of ray march, like ray marching. Okay, there's ray casting, ray tracing, line tracing, ray marching. These are all pretty similar. They all use a similar technique of ray casting for kind of different purposes. Line tracing and ray casting are pretty much identical. We don't need to worry about all the details. Ray tracing is effectively taking it a step further with uh, being able to trace rays that bounce around and we don't need to know, know about ray marching um but it is certainly not line casting this is fishing okay <laughs> a, you know a fishing terminology we're not doing line casting okay so ray casting ray tracing line tracing ray marching all that kind of stuff has to do with the same technique okay let's first talk a little bit about what ray casting is in the simplest terms okay so you may have heard of a laser pointer Okay, this is a laser pointer, and see how I can kind of shoot it on my face, shoot it on my hand, shoot it in the lens. Okay, please don't do this at home. You might blind yourself. Please don't do that. But anyways, laser pointers, you're familiar with them. So basically how a laser pointer works is it shoots a laser, and the laser appears up on some kind of surface far away or close by, as you could see. But imagine if that laser pointer was to tell you information, like it just like had a speaker and it was like, hey, additional information. What if the laser pointer told you how far away the point was from the laser pointer? Guess what? We actually have that type of tool. It's called like a laser tape measure. It's pretty cool. But imagine if it went even further. What if it also identified the object that the laser was hitting? So if you like shot like a stop sign or something that might even be illegal, don't do it. Uh, you shot a stop sign and it told you that this was a stop sign. I bet our technology is already there. If it isn't I bet it's coming if it's not already there, uh, where we can essentially use these types of tools to be able to identify objects simply by shooting a laser at them. Okay, and what if it could even tell us a very specific point on the object that the laser hit? So, for example, like a GPS position where that laser hit. Okay, that would be pretty cool. And that's exactly what line tracing, what ray casting is. Okay, so basically we're shooting a line in a you know totally straight line and when it intersects with some kind of object geometry something it will let us know and it'll tell us what it is and where that um intersection happened that's really all ray casting is if that's all you need to know then you can leave the video but we have a lot more that we can talk about such as when do you use ray casting okay so there's actually two primary kinds of places i mean you can kind of number these in however you want, but to keep it simple, I'm going to pretend like there's two primary ways that you might want to use ray casting. One is to do first person um, perspective object interaction. Oof, that's a lot of words. Um, but basically, when you're playing a game that is generally a three-dimensional game and the player sees the game world through a camera, Okay, so when I say a camera, I mean it's basically how the player gets to see what's in the world. In order for the player to then interact with that world, we can sometimes use ray casting. So for example, let's say that you're creating some first person perspective game, and then there's like a crosshair or some kind of thing like that. It could be like a first person shooter, it could be any kinds of any type of game. And essentially what maybe you want to do is notify the player that an object that the player is pointing at is interactable. Okay, so for example, there might be a weapon on the ground. So let's say the player is kind of like, let's say looking at, you know, there's a hallway, something like this, and here's the hallway, and there's like uh, maybe some paintings on the wall or some trash like that. Okay, very cool. You know, there's some paintings, there's like a door. As you can see, I am a brilliant artiste, and our painting's like super high. All right, well anyways, so there might be something on the floor like uh, a deadly hamburger, right? So there's like a hamburger on the floor, Yum, yum, yum. It's like a gigantic hamburger, apparently. Um, and when the player's mouse cursor, or let's say the crosshair, goes over the 
um, hamburger, then let's say the hamburger kind of has a glow to it, okay? Indicating that the player can interact with this hamburger. It could be a weapon. Maybe the hamburger is a weapon, okay? Depends on who you ask. Or maybe it's a mystery game and the player um, needs to be able to see what kind of clues they can find. Maybe the painting is a clue or maybe there's a key on the floor and it glows in order to indicate that it's interactable. So in that particular um, way of rake or the uh, benefit of raycasting is where they shoot the laser pointer, right? So a line directly from the center of the camera, directly from the crosshair into world space. And if the first thing that that ray, that line touches is an interactable object, then the interactable object will be told to glow. Okay, and that tells the player that, yay, we can interact with this object. So that's one way to be able to use ray casting. But perhaps there are other ways to be able to use it. For example, maybe to place objects in a strategy game. So maybe in a strategy game, like there's terrain like this, right? There's some kind of terrain. There's maybe like a tower or some kind of thing like that on, you know, boop, 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 some kind of tower or something like that. And uh, from the first person perspective, so when I say first person perspective, I don't necessarily mean it's a first person shooter, right? It could be a first person perspective from, you know, way up high, almost like GPS style or something like that, right? So when you're placing a, an object in the world, such as like, you know, some kind of unit, so there's like a little character, like we, um, you don't want to place the character like in the floating in the middle of the air so it falls and, you know, goes splat right you want to be able to place it directly on the ground so how do you know if uh it's you know where the ground is well if you're shooting this ray it can just be okay this is where the ground is remember the ray with ray casting tells the uh one casting the ray exactly where that point intersected so if the surface was here right or here or here or here or here then we know what those positions are so that when we're placing our unit or object in a location, we can just place it at the position of the intersecting line on the surface so that we don't accidentally put it inside of geometry or you know, way above geometry so that the object falls and goes splat or something terrible like that. So this is pretty cool for us to be able to do that in a 3D game or even a 2D game, right? But in, when we're talking about first person's perspective, we're, t you know, I'm, I mean a uh, 3D game. Okay. Um, and then, of course, lastly, there's just the whole idea of a first person shooter, first person's perspective game where you are shooting an object. And really shooting an object is not much different than like making an object glow, except that we're making it glow, so to speak, the moment we click rather than continuously while our mouse is over it. So ultimately it's really not much different than our first example where we're interacting with objects in space and we're making them glow. So um, for a first person shooter, for example, if the player has some kind of weapon, so let's say that this first person shooter is actually, uh, I don't know, a game show. And there's like a bunch of like contestants out here like, hey, pick me, pick me. You know, so it's not actually like a shooter. You're just kind of like pointing your finger. It's like, this is the shooter. It's like, here's your hand. It's like, who am I going to pick to come up here and play the game show? Uh, I don't know. This looks kind of silly, right? <laughs> you know, and you have this little crosshair. This is like the most boring game in the world where you're just like choosing contestants or something like that. As you can see, it's really not that different than what we did with choosing the hamburger on the ground, except that we're choosing a contestant. When we click, it'll say like, oh, yay, we clicked that uh, contestant, right? Something like that. And you can use raycasting to, to say, yes, this selection, this shot will connect connect so to speak as in the shot will hit the object that you are t attempting to, sh to shoot at right and so in a first person shooter first person perspective game like that where you're selecting something by clicking this is something that you want to know um, and all you do is just draw a line to that crosshair so like whoa did we select something and the you know cool benefit on top of that is not only will it say yes you selected the object that you your mouse was over but what it will be able to do is tell you exactly where on the object it selected the object. Okay, so for example, in this game, if there's first person perspective game and your crosshair was here and you shot, it could create like a little poof 
animation on the wall, like wee. Oh, that's a really weird animation. But the point is that it adds even a little bit more impact to your your action by making a little thing happen. Or let's say when you shoot and it hits like a particular part of some kind of body, and it could be like a rag doll. It says the the impact hit at this particular part of the rag doll, and so then it knocks that rag doll back from that very specific location making it look even more cool with like physics systems and that kind of thing. Um, so absolutely powerful to be able to use Raycasts. I wanted to take a quick um, aside to mention the difference between Raycasting and projectiles because those are two distinct um, operations or two distinct kinds of uh, strategies that you might take in a first person perspective again a first person shooter right so you would use ray casting when you're shooting some kind of weapon or making some kind of selection that happens instantaneously or for all intents and purposes instantaneously like some kind of sniper rifle or something like that that shoots very very quickly you typically choose something like a ray cast instead of a projectile but if you're shooting something like a rocket launcher or maybe our game show game instead of selecting our contestant let's say we're actually shooting t-shirts at them with like a t-shirt cannon right we got it's like t-shirt bazooka you know here's our t-shirt bazooka and it goes and it shoots like yay here's a t-shirt for you i think it's usually wadded up um and you can shoot t-shirts at them some kind of fun game like that um, in that case, you would want to use a projectile, right? Uh, and so, but the difference between a ray cast and a projectile is pretty different, right? Because in a ray cast, you shoot one time, shoot, and you just essentially check to see if there's an intersection once. A projectile continuously is moving and checking for intersection every single tick, and is checking its bounds against, like, two-dimensional or three-dimensional bounds against something else that's two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? And so that can be pretty expensive. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on in this video. Okay, so those are kind of the first way that you might want to use ray casting. The second way that you would often want to use ray casting is uh, essentially allowing objects to see or like boundary checking. Okay, so with the first way of using ray casting, essentially a, you know, category of ways of using ray casting. It's mostly the player being able to interact with objects in space. Um, however, you can use ray casting so that, uh, oopsie doodle, objects um, are able to see whether or not other objects are behind walls or, you know, or if uh, certain objects are on top of the ground. We'll talk about that here one by one. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, let's say like a stealth game, right? So we have um, a top-down 2D game. See, we can use it in 2D as well, right? So we've got our object here, our object here, our object here. And then we have our little, you know, baddie, right? This little bad guy, little bad character. And you're this little stealth character, right? Maybe it's like a character with like a sock on its head and there's some music playing. do 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 I don't know if any of you know the reference. Anyways, you're kind of navigating this maze, and what you don't want to happen is for this NPC to see you, right, as it's kind of marching around. Right now, you as the player feels confident that since you're behind this geometry, that the enemy is not going to see you, right? Because, boop, 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 nope, there's a wall here, right? Um, so this is one way that ray casting is very beneficial, because one way of checking to see if a player is within the range of an enemy is to just essentially check to see if the player is within like some kind of circle radius or something like that right so this is like aggroing aggroing an enemy um but see the problem with this checking to see if the player is within the circle is that the in this case this sock headed player character uh is within the it was is within the radius of the circle and so that would say uh oh the player is being detected however the player um is behind this boundary so it would seem unfair to the player that this npc was able to see the player so instead we use something a little bit more sophisticated we use these ray casts okay so we can have the enemy go boop, 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 boop. okay look while the play the enemy could hypothetically see the player there is this um geometry in the way so when a ray is cast when a line is cast, a line is traced out, it 
hits this first, and so therefore it stops. It stops the line so that it doesn't see that the player is here because it will stop at the first object that the line can intersect with, okay? And so you can do that, and you can even draw essentially the boundaries or the, you know, like the cone of visibility by just essentially drawing more of these lines, right? You don't have to draw that many lines because what you can do is you just can just kind of fill it in. Like, okay, fill in this space so that you can even let the player know more easily what the enemy is able to see and what the enemy is not able to see. Okay, so it might not have to be an enemy. It might just be, this is you with like, who ever wore socks in their head when they go to bed? You know, like a nightcap? What is that? I don't even know what a nightcap is. Someone please explain in the comments what a nightcap is. If I'm even thinking of like nightcap, I think I actually might have multiple meanings. I don't know. But the point is maybe you're just sneaking out of bed because you want to watch your, you know, like Saturday morning, 3 a.m. cartoons. Um, and you don't want your parents who are just constantly walking around the house at three in the morning to be able to see or detect you. All right. So anyways, <clears throat> and you can draw that kind of cone of visibility or, or you know, something like that. And you can do that with Raycast. It's pretty neat. All right. So. That's one thing. So allowing an object that's not necessarily the player character to be able to see whether or not an object is, uh, you know, is is uh, visible to another object, right? And let's say that our um, character, the sock head, also has the ability to teleport. What? Okay, so let's say that the sock headed character can also kind of like teleport, like go from here, just goes poof, and then like can teleport to here with the sock on its head or something like that. Some neat thing like that. Blink, I think, is what it was called originally in the you know Warcraft days and that kind of thing. Um, very neat. But how about you're not able to like blink through geometry, right? You can't like go from here and then blink through this object and then suddenly appear here. Like you can't do that because that would be cheating and you're able to get like through doors like you're not supposed to be able to get through and so you can use ray casting to be able to check to see if you're able to blink or you're able to teleport in that particular direction not to that particular position right so that's another way of using ray casting not only for visibility but to just to see if your player can go through a particular object and then now that we're on the topic of um, objects going through other objects. Let's talk a little bit about how projectiles work when it comes to detecting whether a projectile has collided with some kind of geometry, right? So let's say that, you know, we're launching some kind of ball. It's some kind of ball like this. It's going pew, 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 pew. And as soon as it hits this wall, the ball is going to go splat, right? Splat, splat, splat. Some neat thing like that. But here's the thing. It doesn't always work that way because how does it know if the ball has collided with this wall? Let's say the wall is actually kind of thin, right? So this is some kind of like thin wall. And so how it works is that the physics engine is checking, okay, this tick, this frame, we're going to check to see if the ball is currently overlapping the wall. Okay, next frame, we're going to check to see if the ball is intersecting the wall. If it gets to this point, it's going to say, is it intersecting the wall? It'll say yes. Once it's intersecting the wall, it's going to be like, awesome. We're going to go ahead and initiate our explosion uh, sequence or whatever it is that is going to happen. But here's the thing. What if that doesn't happen? What if our game is running pretty slowly and here's the check and then here's the, here's the you know, where the ball is. OK, so this is like frame one and two and three and four. And you can see the problem with this is that. As it's drawing the different positions of the ball as it's progressing in a particular direction, it might go from position three to position four, where neither three nor four intersected, the ball intersected the wall, right? So it effectively just went through the wall. And that actually is a huge problem when it comes to projectiles in games. And actually, a lot of games suffered this problem. And so players were able to exploit things, players were able to fall through floors or other kinds of weird stuff. Um, so what you do is instead of just checking to see has the ball hit, you know, collided with the wall, is that what you do is that not only do you check your current position to see if it's like overlapping a wall, but what you're actually doing is you're check you're drawing a ray to its former position. Okay, so you're just drawing every single tick, you're drawing a ray to see if the line between its current position and the former position has intersected and a geometry. If it did, then we know, oops, we accidentally skipped through something. And in this case, we want to say here at frame four that no, actually, it the collision did happen. It just 
you know, the physics engine was so slow or the wall was so thin that we didn't get to check at a position between three and four, right? So draw that ray between the, the fourth position and the third position. You find out that there was actually supposed to be a collision at that point, And then um, essentially you're retroactively saying, nope, there was a collision. Pretty cool. All right. So that's how you can, uh, you can effectively protect projectiles from going through objects. Okay. Of course, it adds a little bit more math and a little bit more, uh, you know, CPU cycles to be able to make sure that, you know, that you're doing that extra check. Um, but in many cases, it's it's uh, very helpful to do that. You don't always need to do that. But in a case of a ball going through, you know, bouncing around in, in an environment, it might be worth your while. OK, speaking of making sure that things don't go through surfaces, um, what you can do is you can use ray casting to check to see if something is actually on top of another surface. So for example, let's say you're doing a platform game and here's your platform character and your platform character to you, it obvious is that the player is on the floor. But how does the game know that the player is on the floor, right? Because let's say that you want to create some kind of system where the player is able to jump if they hit the space bar, right? Or they jump by hitting the A button or cross button on on the controller or something like that, right? So they press the cross button or they press the A button or they press the space bar, anyways, um, in order to cause the player to jump, wee, something like that. But um, you don't want the player to be able to jump if the player's already in the air, or maybe in most games now, it's like the player's actually expecting to be able to jump while the player's in the middle of the air or something like that, right? Um, but when the player is in the air, you don't want the player to be able to jump, right? So how do you create that logic? Well, what you do is you basically say, well, if the player is on the ground and the X or the A or the space bar are pressed, then initiate the jump. And if not, then don't do the jump. And so how do you check to see if the player is on the ground? Like the player can see, like, obviously the player is on the ground, but it's not necessarily that obvious to the game. Right, the player might happen to be intersect, uh, colliding with some kind of geometry. But what if the player is cr colliding with, uh, you know, like is here, right? It's like colliding with this wall. If we're just saying like is touching something, then it would be able to jump if the player was here, just like kind of touching this wall. You'd be able to just kind of jump up the wall like this is like Tony Hawk or some other kind of super realistic game, right? You're able to just kind of jump up the wall, and that's you know an exploit. So you don't want to just say, is player touching something? You want to check to see if the player is touching something specific. Now, of course, you could just create some kind of like box, like underneath the player's feet to say, is the box touching anything? But the box could be touching the wall as well. So it's like, oh, I'll just make it smaller so that it can, you know, it's only going to, that's kind of finicky, right? So you can do something a lot less expensive and a lot easy and a lot more reliable by just drawing a ray, just like draw a ray underneath the player. Yeah, this is a player, um, I don't know, some kind of pogo player. Anyways, just draw a ray and check to see if the ray is touching an object directly underneath the player, right? Remember, you can see how far away the ray is. So if you cast a ray from the bottom of the player and it touches something directly underneath the player, um, then you can say that fairly safely the player is on the ground, right? So this is a pretty easy, quick way to be able to do it. And it's pretty inexpensive to the processor because you only need to make that check when you care about whether or not the player is on the ground, such as if you want to allow the player to be able to jump. Okay, so pretty neat. So many uses of ray casting, it's amazing. In fact, what about self-driving cars, right? Like you have a car, here's the windshield, here's the back shield. I guess we call it the rear windshield and it's kind of driving and you want to be able to check, hey, is there any geometry in front of me? If so, then do X, do Y. It's a very complex, potential, <laughs> potentially complex algorithm. And this is maybe when you do want the car to know whether or not there's a stop sign. Um, maybe they're not using ray casting to, to determine that it's a, a stop sign, but you can at least use it to determine if you're about to run into a deer or if you need to avoid some kind of uh, obstacle or pass cars in a lane or parallel parking. You know, so we use these types of sensors and they're effectively just rays. They're just ray casts, okay? It's super neat. All right, cool. Let's go on to the next topic. Make sure we're still recording. Neato, 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 cheeto. All right. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is just uh, 
the actual algorithm for doing raycast. I'm not going to talk about it too much. You can go on Wikipedia, check to see line intersection. There's a whole algorithm there. That's not what we want. That what we're talking about. We're just talking about understanding how it works. Okay. So when we're talking about, you know, how expensive is raycasting? Let's talk a little bit about what raycasting is. I'm um, going full circle here, full line here is you have a you have a line and you have a line <laughs> and you check to see do these lines intersect that's all it is that's all it is people people that's all it is you have a, a line you know with point a and point b and you have another line with point x and point y if that's not confusing whatever and basically you're just using some kind of formula that we've been using time and time again is line between point x and y and line between point a and b intersecting and where is it intersecting right that's all it is that's the whole thing behind ray casting right and that's in two-dimensional space in three-dimensional space you check to see if that same line doesn't have to be the same line is intersecting some plane right so is it intersecting some plane it is it's intersecting right here something like that right so you're still checking a you know one dimensional line or yeah anyways you're still checking a line um and you're checking to see if it's going into a plane right into some kind of surface and when i say plane i'm referring to a um one facet of a three-dimensional object okay so that's how um, that's really all it boils down to with ray casting. So the question with that is how expensive is that, right? If I wanted to be able to check to see if the mouse is like currently hovering over some kind of uh, clue in a 3D game, or even like a fast-paced first-person shooter game, you know, multiplayer, and you want to be able to see if you got like a headshot or some other kind of cool thing, right? Um, and so you want to have some pretty you know, fast and precise detection. Okay. How do you do that? Well, let's say that you're going full on and you're trying to check to see if your, your character, right? So here's your, here's your character like, ta-da. And it's like our beautiful character model, like, hooray. And our character model is composed of all sorts of different, you know, vertices and different faces, right? And then maybe it's even tessellized that's how tessellation works <laughs> right so there's all these different little uh vertices and uh triangles right and the same thing with our character's head right so there's like all sorts of different faces tessellate meaning it's turned into triangles so and let's say that this particular player uh character that you were checking you know our ray against is like a hundred thousand polygons something absurd right <laughs> um even 10,000 polygons right so there's 10,000 polygons and then there are a hundred can you imagine a game where there's a hundred players in the same match that would be insane right so anyways there's a hundred there's like a hundred of these characters each of them have a hundred thousand polygons and then there's also like trees and there's rocks and there's all sorts of crazy stuff and it all has different geometry and you want to be able to check to see if your your um weapon is going to shoot through like geometry or hit some player where on the player it's going to hit well that means that when you shoot you're checking to see against millions of triangles you're doing this particular operation now this operation is has quite a few different checks right and you're doing all sorts of different math um, involved in making that check and to see where that check had occurred or where the, the cast, the hit occurred. That requires quite a bit of math, right? But if you're only doing it one time on one frame, it's not necessarily that bad unless you're doing it against like billions of these faces, right? Even then, it can you can do it. It's really not that bad. Processors are pretty quick nowadays, but the thing is billions, you know, is there any way that we can make it even cheaper, you know? quite a bit cheaper. Yes, absolutely. Right? So you basically just break it down by first excluding anything that isn't possibly part of the raycast. Right? So if we're talking about a player, you know, where the, here's the player and the player has a camera, right? So here's the camera. It's like right attached to the player's face. That looks like a megaphone, but that's okay. It's a player and the raycast happens directly from the player's face. Well, what you can do is you can exclude all geometry on this side of the player, right? Just exclude it. You don't need it, 
right? Because it can't, it can't be possibly touching any of that. Right, so uh, there's much more sophisticated algorithms. Than what I'm explaining to you, I'm just trying to help you understand how, the gen generally speaking, we approach these types of algorithms to see uh, to to make it cheaper to be able to cast a ray and check it against geometry in like one of these sophisticated, highly complex 3D games. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Just say don't check anything behind the player. Right, relatively simple. This is effectively zoning uh your your check right you're saying this zone that zone right and you can zone things even further into essentially different quadrants or different sectors and so you can check only the different areas of the map or the level of the game that could possibly have received that ray cast right so that's one way uh, to be able to break it down but you you can break it down in many other ways so for example this particular player object can be uh, surrounded by some kind of bounding box, right? So there's like some kind of cube, cube is how we say it in American English. Anyway, cube, right? So there's some kind of cube that the, the this is invisible cube that the, that the uh, enemy NPC or the enemy player character is, is standing inside of, right? So the cube doesn't really do much. All it does is it simplifies certain collisions and certain checks. If all the players are inside of a cube in uh, this invisible kind of bounding box, um, then instead of each player being 100,000 vertices, the player is only like, what, six vertices? Uh, is there six vertices? Six uh, planes that you're checking your, your, your ray against? then obviously that's a lot cheaper, right? That's significantly cheaper by orders of magnitude. Uh, it's cheaper. Um, and so you, you might be thinking like, no, I want to see if it's a headshot. Uh, um, well, guess what? You can still do that by first checking to see if that ray intersected this bounding box. If it had intersected the bounding box, then that means that the ray could have hit the player. If the ray never intersected the bounding box, then it could never have intersected the player. Ta-da! You know, right? So um, first check to see if it intersects the bounding box. And if it intersects the bounding box, then you can check to see like, oh, okay, is it going to potentially be a headshot? Well, maybe there even is like a sub cube or something like that. You know, of course, there's like a certain diminishing return by amounts of like cubes you have floating around with checks, but you still are significantly reducing the amount of work that these ray casts are have to, to apply if there's like one type of damage for the head and one type of damage for the body then you can then check the head and then check to see after it's like saying yes it's in the head region or something like that then yeah you can like go in and check to see individual vertices and you're only checking the individual vertices up in this area and not all the individual vertices vertices faces it down in this area right so you're still cutting down the amount of work that your computer is doing by a lot most likely right so this is how we do it, and you can learn all about these kinds of algorithms to be able to break down searches in this way, but we're doing it with ray casting. And oftentimes you don't need your ray to go on infinite, right? If you shoot some kind of weapon, you don't necessarily want the player to like shoot a weapon and then just like randomly like 10 miles away. It's like, you killed something, uh, right? So there's like a limit to the ray. Your, your line doesn't have to be infinite. Your line can be like a fixed line from point X to point Y. And if that's the case, then you can check to see in some kind of sphere if you can just check the objects that are within the range and actually not the whole sphere right just like it wouldn't matter either way um but you're just checking to see and that's a lot cheaper to see if one point is essentially within another point it's just the pythagorean theorem to see if it's just inside of this sphere and if it is then you can start doing your raycast and everything else skip it so you can make it a lot cheaper so generally speaking raycasting is cheap don't worry about it being too expensive unless you're doing something really zany and crazy. You can be shooting rays all over the place. It doesn't really matter. In fact, you can use rays to make other operations cheaper. So, for example, if there is a game where there is a projectile, such as shooting a t-shirt and it hits somebody, I guess you would maybe want to have physics on the t-shirt. But if there's a game where, A, there's potentially no physics, and B, there is no moving geometry that can collide, can, like, intercept the projectile then and it's so it's basically always a clear shot it's always a straight shot then instead of checking the projectile every single tick like this you know check 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 every single tick of it's going forward you can just do one freaking ray just like phew, just do one ray say hey it's on a collision course and nothing's going to intercept it 
with this particular object. It's this far away. The projectile is moving this fast. We can do a very basic you know, calculation to figure out how long it'll take for that object to get there. And you just draw a simple animation. No like continuous checks every tick. Just do one ray, make it go animate along a line. And once it gets to that point in you know, the, the tweens, you know, basically the animation, once it gets to the point where you know that that collision is going to occur without having to do a check every single tick, then make your little explosio thing, your explodo thing happen, right? And the, the gamer is none the wiser, right? Only one check not a whole bunch. So rays are super cheap, usually, uh, and they're incredibly powerful. I hope you learned a lot with this particular lesson. You have gone from someone who doesn't know what a raycast is to someone who does know what a raycast is. I hope you feel pretty smart, okay? So if you liked this content, then please like it, subscribe, leave a comment below, and in the meantime, wishing you peace.